Welcome everyone to my review of IDW Sonic Scrapneck Island Issue 4, the conclusion to the miniseries. As always, from this point forward, there will be spoilers. Things got darker last time as Mecha Sonic's plan for Sonic was to swap minds with him so he can get his revenge on Dr. Eggman for abandoning him. The key to his plan was Tails' Miles Electric, which the Two-Tailed Fox brought with him when he and the Egg Robo assistants tried to rescue Sonic. Unfortunately, Mecha Sonic plucked off the rescue party one by one, stole the Miles Electric, and threw Tails down a garbage chute to his apparent demise. Now, Mecha Sonic is ready to execute his plan. Here we are, Sonic strapped to the table, unable to do anything as Mecha Sonic makes the final preparations for the mind transfer process. We learn more about what that thing on Sonic's head is, an old prototype that Eggman was going to use to directly control Badnix with his mind. But once he successfully got it working, he got bored with it and moved on to something else. Typical. Also, you may be wondering why we're seeing modern Eggman instead of classic Eggman here. Maybe when Sigma was reprogramming Mecha Sonic, he could have updated Eggman's image profile since Sigma was more than likely built after Sonic Adventure. Or at the very least, the Scrapnecks were able to glance at what Eggman looks like now thanks to the egg carrier they have. By the way, Mecha's doing all this mad science because he believes the scrambled egg carrier won't fly. Using the helmet set up with the Miles Electric, Mecha will transfer himself into Sonic's mind because he plans to use the Hedgehog's abilities to run on water to finally escape Scrapnik Island. Presumably once his foot heals, cause that's still an issue. Sonic tries to shame Mecha by pointing out that he'll be abandoning Sigma and the other Scrapniks, his friends. Mecha replies the Scrapniks were never his friends and considers the concept of friendship a weakness. Oh, I can list a number of examples where you're wrong about that, but let's move on. Mecha Sonic begins the procedure, and it appears to be working. Too bad for him, the lesser Scrapniks, who were watching from above, overheard the entire conversation. They distract him long enough so they can destroy the machine, canceling the process. Angry that his work is ruined, he unleashes his frustrations out on the Scrapniks the only way he knows how. I quit you! As the Scrapniks free Sonic, the Hedgehog hears a voice in his head, along with fragmented memories and feelings of anger and sadness, and it's not coming from him. How interesting. Odd feelings or not, the Scrapniks are in trouble, and Sonic jumps to their defense. Sonic and Mecha run through the hallways, with Sonic forcing himself forward despite the pain. That's when the voice pops back into Sonic's head, and yeah, it's Mecha Sonic's. When the Scrapniks interrupted the mind transfer process, it somehow caused the two minds to link, and thus can now sense each other's feelings. Hmm, there's something familiar about this. Mecha tells Sonic he knows nothing about pain or what it's like to lose your purpose in life. He's confident he'll win this time due to Sonic being limited by his injury. Oh Mecha, Sonic's got your limit right here. They speed through the Death Egg's incinerator, that's still operational for some reason, and duke it out inside the central furnace. Sonic manages to get an opening and kicks Mecha in the face with his injured foot, not only breaking the boot off, but literally kickstarting Mecha's Sigma programming. More than likely due to the link they share, Sonic senses the return of good Mecha and tries to save his robotic doppelganger from a fiery demise, only for said doppelganger to refuse. Wait a minute. I guess the creators took more from the Sonic OVA than just Knuckles' hat. Mecha's envious of Sonic's carefree lifestyle, and that he's a failure at both destroying him and protecting the Scrapniks. Unlike OVA Sonic, this Sonic won't let the robot melt into nothingness. He gives the old, you determine your own purpose spiel, before once again reaching out for Mecha's hand. This time, Mecha Sonic accepts. That's nice and all, However, Sonic overdid it during the fight and cannot move. Cue the arrival of Tails. Told you he'd return during the climax. He and the Scrapniks, including Sigma and a repaired Mecha Knuckles, pull the two out of the furnace. As all the smaller Scrapniks surround Mecha Sonic, Sigma begs for forgiveness. 
he did not understand what Mecha was going through on the inside. Sonic can tell his watch, and the former starts crying. Sonic claims they're not his tears. Due to the link between him and Mecha, he's right. Still think friendship is a weakness, Mecha? Soon after, Tails was able to remove the Eggman programming from both Mecha Sonic and Mecha Knuckles. Sigma thanks Sonic and Tails for everything they've done, and they go off to repair the tornado. The final two pages feature some narration by Mecha Sonic, that or he's mentally talking to Sonic. Either way, Mecha Sonic states how he plans to move forward from his dark past and embrace an uncertain future with his Scrapnik friends. And as he watches Sonic and Tails leave the island with the rest of the Scrapniks, he vows to live for tomorrow while cradling his sunflower. It's not every day that a horror villain gets a happy ending. I mean, I can't even think of one off the top of my head. The closest I can come up with is the monster in Young Frankenstein, but even then, that's an affection and parody that leans more towards comedy than horror. In that film, the monster is loved and accepted, just like Mecha Sonic at the end. Though in order to reach that point, Mecha had to dabble in villainy before literally getting some sense knocked into him. Mecha's crazy and desperate plan to escape Scrapnik Island. He has witnessed firsthand at what Sonic can do, however, he's only seeing things from a machine's point of view. While he is capable of smashing robots and running on water, Sonic is still a living being with limitations. For crying out loud, his foot was injured throughout most of the arc. Had the transfer succeeded, like I said in the summary, Mecha would have to wait for Sonic's foot to heal enough to start running on water. Even then, a number of factors could go wrong for Mecha if he attempted this feat. Uh, pardon the pun. Sonic's foot could give out in an inopportune moment, and he'd fall into the water and drown. Then there are things like the body's stamina and the massive ocean waves, which could more than likely result in the same outcome. Fact is, we don't know how far it is between Scrapnik Island and the nearest populated landmass. It has to be hundreds of miles at least. Why do you think Sonic and Tails utilize a tornado in this story? And yet, Mecha is crazy enough to take the risk if it means leaving Scrapnik Island. Even if by some chance Mecha succeeded, as I have said before, he would discover Eggman's other loyal robotic doppelganger, meaning the Doctor would have moved on from him, which could have added to the tragedy of Mecha Sonic. It's a good thing the Scrapniks, well, scrapped that plan. Okay, that one was intentional. I'm not that bothered by the Scrapniks easily stopping the mind transfer process. For one, they're smaller and more maneuverable, there's a lot of them, and as you saw, they caught Mecha off guard. It's kinda like how insects would behave. As for why they're present, they could have been crawling around and randomly spotted Sonic in danger like the Scrapnik Ben last issue. Or perhaps, Ben told them after informing Tails. Whatever the case, they saved Sonic's life. It must have hurt them to see Mecha doing a bad thing, and him denouncing them as friends. Especially since thanks to the flashbacks, Mecha was beloved by the Scrapniks. Although in their defense, they may not know about the Eggman programming issue. Having him say he'll crush them didn't help the situation. When the preview pages containing this line were released, people went nuts. For those unaware, the line, I'll crush you, comes from the web series Super Mario Bros. Z, a crossover between Mario and Sonic in the tone of Dragon Ball Z using game sprites. One of the villains was Mecha Sonic, and during the conflict between him and the heroes, the Axum Rangers from Super Mario RPG decide to challenge Mecha to a fight. It doesn't go well for them. Before he made quick work of the group, he said the line people were jumping for joy over. Confession time, I never saw SMBZ or heard much about it until I had to look up what was the deal with the line. Yeah, I'm out of touch, but I'm happy for those who love the shout out. Going back to Mecha Sonic's relationship with the Scrapniks, it eventually worked out, but only after Mecha Sonic went through some conflict both outside and in. Not only did Sonic and Mecha Sonic duke it out physically, they had a brief mental showdown with the main crux being, what do you do if you cannot fulfill your original purpose? After getting his good programming kicked back online, Mecha believed himself to be a failure in both a destroyer and a protector, and was ready to end his existence. That is pretty dark. One motivational speech from Sonic, plus the mental link, helped show Mecha the error of his ways, and the two finally grab hands. This section right here reminds me of Toy Story 3. If you know, you know. 
I already said in issue 1 that the Scrapniks remind me of Sid's toys, so might as well throw one more nod to the movies. Back over to Sonic and Mecha locking hands. That's actually a nice touch. Sonic and Mecha were going for a friendly handshake back in issue 2, but it was interrupted thanks to a conflict that wound up with Mecha getting knocked back into evil. Now, after being knocked back towards good, the two finally lock hands. Once the conflict was over and the Eggman personality purged, the two have reached an understanding. I like the nice visual touch with Mecha Sonic's word bubbles, or rather, his thought bubbles. How it's an orange color while he still had the Eggman programming, and once removed, it changed to white signaling that his mind is free and clear of the Doctor's influence. Sonic himself must be thrilled because, for once, he succeeded in reforming one of his knockoffs, especially since Daniel revealed on Twitter that Scrapnik Island takes place between issues 56 and 57. Mechasonic serves as a nice counterpoint to both Metal Sonic and Surge the Teneric. Sonic gave all three a chance to go live their lives, when he believed they were no longer under their creator's thumb. Metal Sonic refused to change and went straight back to Eggman because he hated Sonic and Eggman made sure he remained loyal to him. Surge was conditioned to take out Sonic and couldn't walk away to make her own path. Even if she had disposed of Sonic, her follow-up plan was to burn the world the Hedgehog cared for so much. I think what made Mecha Sonic's turn successful is, in addition to the reprogramming, Sonic actually took the chance to understand his adversary's pain. Once again, thanks to the mental link. This does beg the question, does Sonic and Mecha Sonic still share a link? I assume so, unless Tails was able to remove that along with the Eggman programming. And if they do, it's probably active when they're close to each other. It would be awkward if the two were able to still read each other's minds from hundreds of miles away. The creators went all in with the Sonic OVA nods, besides Knuckles' hat and recreating a situation where, this time, the robot doppelganger gets a happier ending. Natalie Fordrain made a promo image of issue 4 that is a nod to the cover art for the Sonic OVA's second part. It's actually pretty impressive. There's also a nod to another anime, Evangelion, with this panel right here of Sonic and Mecha staring directly at the Death Egg's remains. Natalie was kind to point out this nod on Twitter. There is one nod that I wouldn't have spotted right away had Daniel not tweeted about it. This panel right here when Mecha Sonic and Sonic were swapping minds is a shout out to the cover of Archie Sonic Archives Volume 10. The set that contains issue 39, the one in which Sonic was transformed into a robot. And the name of this transformed Sonic? Mecha Sonic. Wow. First the Mecha Sonic vs Mecha Knuckles fight from issue 2, and now this. It's almost as if they were fans of Archie Sonic's Mecha Madness arc. I don't blame them, it is a great story in both concept and visuals. Let's go through some random observations. Good to see Sigma and his assistants are fine. At the same time, it kind of lessens the tension from the last issue, how they were plucked off one by one and left to an uncertain fate, but then here, they are right as rain. And if you notice, Sigma returns with an old Eggmobile to help rescue Sonic and Mecha Sonic. Maybe Tails and or the Scrap Mix found them and fixed them. They are machines after all. Perhaps Daniel wanted to leave what happened to them up to our imaginations. And people's imaginations can go all over the place. I bet you there are some people that would have preferred Sigma and his assistants get mangled to keep with the horror theme present throughout most of the miniseries and have some sort of downer ending with Sonic and Tails escaping, but at the cost of a civilization. Maybe even taking the Sunflower with them as a way to remember them. But I think having friendly robots getting wrecked would be too much for some people, and it would get in the way of the story's hopeful nature. Now that we've reached the end, some of the creators are sharing more of their contributions to the miniseries i.e. the Scrapnik designs. Let's start with Minho Kim's remaining Scrapniks. We have Karina, whose head looks oddly similar to that of Cyril's. I definitely recognize the Fireworm body, and the arms look like they come from Monkey Dude. Casper, who's using an Astron as a head. Dylan, who's using what appears to be a Penguinator as a head. And is that supposed to be a Nebula's propeller helmet? I could have sworn there was another enemy with a propeller on the top, but all I found was the Nebula Badnik, Next is Maximilian, who's clearly using an Orbanaut as a foundation for its design. Kinda looks like a magician thanks to the Orbanaut balls. 
Next up is Gilbert, whose head is a thunder spinner. And lastly is Bill. This one uses the lower half of a roller. The neck might be from a monkey dude's arm. The head is that of a Flyboy 767. And its tail could be the bottom part of a spiny. And that's it for men's contributions, as far as I know. Natalie Hines, another IDW Sonic artist, also contributed some Scrapnik designs. And as you can see, not only did she provide names, but pointed out which component batics were used in their creation. Feel free to pause the video if you want to take a closer look at them. I will point out that the one using the egg pawn head does not appear on Scrapnik Island proper. I'm guessing the idea was they want to limit themselves to just the classic Batniks, the only exception being Gilbert, of course. Overall, I highly recommend the Scrapnik Island miniseries. While most of it has horror elements and atmosphere, it concludes with a sense of hope and optimism, which I'm all for. What's also great about this miniseries is that it can serve as an entry point to IDW Sonic in general. There is no connection to the overall narrative in the main books. It's a self-contained story that uses game assets in new and creative ways, and with the revelation of its overall place in the timeline, the miniseries, particularly its ending, is a much-needed palate cleanser compared to the somber nature of issue 56's ending. Get all four issues if you haven't already, but if you prefer to read it in a graphic novel format, you'll have to wait until August. Should Daniel Barnes write more IDW Sonic in the future? Absolutely. I've said this before in my reviews, and I will keep saying it in the future. I'm always on board for new writers doing work for the series. As long as they communicate with one another. I hope Daniel does contribute more in the future, whether it be the main book, another self-contained miniseries. Credit should also go to Jack Lawrence and Natalie Fordrain for providing the miniseries atmosphere through the art. The door has been left open for the Scrapniks to return in the future. Perhaps one day, Belle the Tinkerer might visit this place. After all, she wants to free the Batniks from Eggman's control, and she would be excited to meet the Scrapniks who had done just that. I have a feeling she and Sigma would get along swell. And with Mecha Sonic actually surviving this story, the chances of him and Metal Sonic to actually meet face to face just went up. I could speculate all day, but I think it's time to wrap this up. Thank you for joining me throughout this surprising, yet great miniseries that helped expand the world of IDW Sonic. It could still be a coincidence, but given the miniseries takes place after issue 56, Sonic's previous leg injuries might not have completely healed, and the crash onto Scrapnik Island may have made the situation worse again. I don't care if you heal fast, Sonic. You need to stay off that leg for a bit.